Hello everyone, welcome to the first lecture of ROP206, Microcontrollers with Lab. In today's lecture, we will have an introduction to the course. So here we have the course logistics. You will need to start reading the first chapter of the textbook. I will provide the details regarding the textbook later. Uh, you already know that the model for the course is already operational. And regarding the lab sessions, we will have the first lab in the next week. So this week, this, there will be no lab. The course will be delivered by five faculty members of the Robotics and Mechatronics Department. I, Tohid Alizadeh, and Professor Abibullayev will deliver the lectures. I will be the instructor for the first section of the course, starting at 9 a.m., and Professor Abibullayev will be the instructor for the second section of the course, which starts at 10.30. For the labs, we have three instructors, Professor Sanligulova, Professor Kappasov and Mr. Tursenbeck. You can see the details regarding each one of them here for sections three and four, section one and two, and section five and six. So each one of the lab instructors will take two sections. You will receive more information regarding the labs from the lab instructors soon during this week. Here we have the course grading policy. Uh, you see the course grading items here. We have the homework assignments. Usually after finishing each topic, you will receive a set of homework assignments. You need to work on it and uh, return, prepare your uh, solutions and return them on time. And uh, then you will get 15% of the total grade from the homework assignments. Regarding lab sessions, there will be 20% of the overall course coming from the labs and there will be around 11 lab sessions. There will be two midterm exams tentatively in the week 5 and week 10. And finally, we will have the final exam, which will be at the end of the semester. You need some uh, knowledge in order to succeed in this course, mainly the programming knowledge in C. And that's something that I think all of you already have. And having some knowledge uh, from the electric and electronic circuits and sensors would be useful. But if you don't have it, and I guess it will be most likely the case for, for the computer science students. Whenever needed, information will be provided by the lab instructors. The course this semester will be delivered totally online. The video lectures will be recorded before the regular lecture times, and they will be made available through Moodle and YouTube channel. You will receive the, the link to the videos once they are ready. But you are supposed to watch the video lectures before the regular lecture sessions. During the online regular lecture sessions, we will have usually the Zoom meetings. And over there, you can attend and uh, ask for the questions if you have any. So that's why it's important to watch the video lectures and study before coming the online sessions. As for the labs, you will also have the online lab sessions. You will get more details regarding the labs from your lab instructor. The main textbook for the course is the Logic and Computer Design Fundamentals by Maurice Mano. Uh, there are a limited number of the hard copies available in the library. I guess around 30 of them are available. But the electronic version of the book should be also available online. I guess you just need to look for it and through Google and the, the first links uh, would be the ones that you are looking for. There are two other textbooks which could be useful for this course. One is the Digital Design and Computer Architecture. And the next one is the Programming 16-bit PIC Microcontrollers in C. Uh, this book will be mostly useful for the lab sections. So for the course itself, for the lectures, let's say, uh, we will not use, use this textbook. All right, so now let's have a quick look at how a simple digital computer is constructed, or the basics of a digital computer. The main three components of a digital computer are listed here. So they are CPU, the central processing unit, memory, 
which is used for storing the information and also the program and IO which stands for input and output. Over here you can see it in the uh, block diagram form. So we have the CPU, the central processing unit, the memory and the input and output. A digital computer could be in the form of a single chip. It could be in the form of a board or it can consist of several boards which are connected to each other. In this example here, in this figure, you can see a, a board in it, which has multiple elements on it. There are slots for the memory, we have the CPU and there are interfaces for the input and outputs. So depending on how complex the digital computer is, you can find them in different forms. But all of them have these three main components. On the other hand, for the microcontrollers, they come in the form of a single chip. So a microcontroller is usually is in the form of a single chip, a single IC or integrated circuit. The microcontrollers also have the CPU, the central processing unit. They also have the memory, which will be in, in the form of both ROM and RAM. We will see the difference between different type of memories later during the course. And they also have the input and output capabilities. Microcontrollers also have some subsystems already integrated into them. The subsystems would include the timers, counters, analog interfaces and I.O. interfaces. We may see some details regarding some of them later over the course. Microcontrollers are usually used to read the input devices. The input devices could be the buttons or different kind of sensors. Then they process the data. They process the information and data that they have collected through the input devices. And they do this using the, the code, the program which is developed for them. And then based on that, they generate some output signals which are used in order to control output devices such as lights, displays, motors, and speakers. And you can find the microcontrollers used in several different devices these days in Lithium. They are indeed at the heart of many devices such as microwave ovens, the washing machines or cell phones and so on and so forth. Moving forward or going uh, one step forward, we have the embedded systems. The embedded systems are indeed information processing systems which are embedded into a larger product such as a train or a car. In this case, the main reason is not just processing the information but performing some physical activity. While with the microcontrollers, they, they are usually used in order to process the information and generate some signals which could be used uh, by some actuators such as lights or displays and so on and so forth. Anyways, the embedded systems are indeed the topic for another course, so we don't indeed uh, discuss further in this regard. Alright, now let's have an overview of the course. Our aim here is to build a simple computer from the digital perspective. As we already started to, to talk about these terms, we have the CPU at the heart or as the brain of a computer. The CPU, which is the central processing unit, has a control unit which uh, exchanges data with a data pass. So the control unit does calculations indeed on the data in the data pass. The CPU, on the other hand, exchanges data with the memory. So memory is used to store data, mainly for later use. And also the CPU is exchanging data with the input and output devices. So it reads data from the input devices and then it writes data into the output devices. Some examples of the input and output devices are listed here. Yeah? The disk, network, monitor, keyboard, mouse, and so on and so forth. If we want to have a simplified view of the system, we can see the system as a discrete information processing system 
which receives some discrete input and it generates some discrete outputs and it might, might have a system state. So the discrete information processing system exchanges data with the system state. So over here we focus on the discrete information. So we have discrete inputs, we have discrete outputs uh, and the, the, the whole system is indeed discrete. Later we see the difference between the discrete and continuous form of information. First we will start neglecting the system state. So this will happen in the first quarter of the course. We assume that there is no system state in the first quarter of the course. So we'll have a really simple view of the computer which doesn't maintain state. So it doesn't have, a, let's say, a form of memory. The computer will not remember what has happened in the past. In this case, when you provide an input, some computation will be performed and an output will be generated. And it will be, it will happen like a mass function. So there will be no memory in it. If you feed the same input, you will get exactly the same output regardless of when you do it. Okay, in which situation you do it. This is what we what we will have in the first quarter. Then in the second quarter, we will consider the system state. So we'll assume that the system state is also there. In this case, the computer is having some form of memory or the system state. So now, if you apply the same input, depending on the state of the system, you may get different output. We can use the input and what it has stored in the memory to determine the output. So what has happened in the past will be also important or it will be taken into account in determining the output. It will not be as simple as the case in which there is no state. As we move forward, you will see the differences uh, in more details later. Then in the second half of the course, we will move forward. So we know that the computer processes the, the information using the programs, which are stored in the memory of the computer. And the program is made up of sequences of instructions. So there will be a set of instructions which will create a program and that program will help the computer or the CPU to process the information. To, after reading the information and processing, it will also generate the output. So basically the programs modify data which is also stored in the memory. So they will, the CPU will have access to the memory and uh, depending on the kind of the program which is stored in the, in the CPU and is executed in it by the CPU, that information could also be processed. Indeed, we will move towards a complete basic computer, yeah? but we will have more details on this in the second half of the course indeed. For the first half of the course, as I mentioned, we will focus on the discrete information processing systems without and with the system state. And then we will move forward and see how the programs are constructed, how the instructions are made, and how they, they are used in order to exchange data between the memory and the CPU, and also how the control unit performs processing on the data using the database. All those details will be provided later. Uh, Alright, so I think that's all for this video. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video soon. Bye for now.